Okay, welcome back. We're in Chapter 5 of the Windows Administration Book, page 441, Directory Services in Windows 2019. So let's just start off. What the heck is Active Directory AD, often abbreviated, and why is this significance? Well, Active Directory, you know, technically it's a hierarchical database of storing objects. Yeah, 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 all that junk. What is it really? Well, it's, it's how a company connects all their computers together. I want to manage all of my computers in one location, and I want to manage all of my accounts in one location, and I want to figure it so if you move from one desk to another, all you have to do is just log in and magic happens and you get everything that you need. It's all about managing computers, okay? And so you have to have some sort of a central thing where it knows about where all the computers are, and some sort of central thing that knows where all the accounts are. So that's what it's about. So clearly every company who has a Windows scenario with you know more than five or six computers is gonna have this Active Directory domain system turned on and enabled. This is why it's a very critical thing. And there's an awful lot of thinking behind this and philosophy and suggestions. And so kind of go slow. This is kind of important. Okay. So uh, after this, I'm going to do a hands-on demo of promoting, that's the term they use, promoting your server to a domain controller. But I've already done that here, so I'm going to be showing you things that are in the book, which you can't really follow along yet because you don't have this stuff installed. Okay, I'm just telling you, all right? Good. Okay, learning objectives. So understanding the uh, Active Directory infrastructure, Understanding the role of domain name uh, services or system. Uh, understanding OU's organizational units and containers. Understanding accounts and groups. Okay, so let's start page 142. So the Active Directory infrastructure. So it's a distributed database. What is, well, what does that mean? Well, that means it appears in more than one location. A hierarchical database, so like a tree structure, you know, like uh, a machine and then here's the servers and then after there's a, a PC, a kind of a tree structure. And it contains objects and an object could be a, a human you know, account or it could be a, a computer, a server, a PC, okay, good. And it uses some protocols. Now Microsoft didn't make these protocols up. It's using a standard one called LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, LDAP. And it's the, it's the language of directory services. I didn't say active directory this time because there's lots of other. LDAP itself is a type of directory services, but they're using the LDAP protocol in order to do this. So this is not a Microsoft standard that they created to do this. They just borrowed the existing LDAP in order to get their active directory stuff working. They use a, a, an authentication system called Kerberos to, you know, both authenticate uh, well, to go through and do the secure authentication to prove you are who you say you are. And then domain naming service, DNS, the, the, there's a piece of that. Um, normal DNS, if you've taken a network course, is uh, I give you a name and it turns around and gives me their, their address, their IP address. That's what DNS does for a living. Okay, kind of cool. But in Active Directory, we actually tweak the DNS server to allow it to do something different. Instead of just querying for a machine and having it give me the IP address, I can query for the domain and it's gonna tell me who I need to be talked to in order to get to the domain. So they, they made an extension to the DNS service, okay? And not like it's out of the ordinary. There's, the DNS services can have all sorts of extensions. So Microsoft just added an extension that says, in, in addition to locating the IP address of mach physical machines, will allow you to, to get to this logical thing called a domain. Okay. So if you were to look at the, the start menu here and go down here, there's a lot of things that have Active Directory in the title. Active Administrative System, Domains and Trust, Module for PowerShell, Sites and Services and Users and Computers. We're going to spend a lot of time down here on this bottom one. Okay. So if you wanted to install this, uh, which I have an entire video on doing it, I'm going to go to server manager and um, I'm going to go to manage, you know, add a role, like kind of 
you've seen all this before. And then it'll allow you, I'm just gonna skip through this because, and so I turned on the Active Directory Domain Services and DNS Services. So that's how that's done. Okay, adding this software doesn't actually make my machine a domain controller. There's more steps in that, but well, that's what the other video is for. Okay, so what is understanding the domain controller? Well, the domain controller basically is the machine that has this database in it. It could have a copy of it because we've talked about it being replicated. So you could have like, it's common practice to not have just one domain controller, right? Because what happens, I mean, it's so important that if this guy goes down, you're not gonna be able to log in in the morning, okay? So almost everyone has two or maybe three. So a, a domain controller is one that has a copy of the database and it can handle requests for, hey, I need to log in. Is this the right person? That kind of stuff. Um, in the old days, we had a thing called a primary domain controller and a backup domain controller. Uh, we don't do that anymore. There's no, there's no distinction. A, any one of the domain controllers can respond to any request for domain services. It doesn't matter where it is. There's no such thing as a primary or secondary kind of a thing. Okay. So understanding the domain on page 145, I've used that term a lot, but I never really defined what the heck a domain is. All right, so a domain is just a logical grouping of computers. You know, I grab these computers and these users and I put them under the control of a single organization. That means like the university has a single domain, okay? And that way the people in the IT department are the ones who control everything about those PCs, what software is installed on there, and all about your user accounts when they get built, and what you can and can't do, all that stuff, that's all in a domain. And that way, that this is what allows you to go from sitting at one desk in a classroom to go to another desk in the classroom and still log in and have everything work. That didn't work at home, does it? I mean, if you have two, two machines and you don't have an account on the other machine, it's gonna say, who the heck are you? Well, that's the point for a domain is everyone gets to share all that information. Cool. So every organization uh, creates a domain of their own, okay? And that's how they manage their systems. So uh, again, I, I'm using this term domain, but I just want to point out the term domain in the context of Active Directory domain is not the same as the DNS term for domain. Okay, it's not exactly the same. Yes, it is true. It sure would be nice that our domain name at the university is absolutely identical to its registered domain name in DNS. It's not. From the outside world, we are temup.edu, okay? But inside our network, we are AMCT. So the domain name inside our network is not the same, you know, as this guy up here, okay? Just telling you. All right, so it, it would be handy if they were the same, but they're not required to be the same. For example, we're gonna configure an Active Directory domain, and we are not gonna go to some domain registration authority and spend $65 and get our, our domain name registered. We're not doing that. So we have no connection to the DNS domain name system at all. Okay, good, all right. <clears throat> so uh, an Active Directory domain is a database and of your internal assets. And a web domain is the address book of what people can get to from the internet. Okay, at the university, I'm making this up because I don't know. Let's say we have 400 computers yeah, at the university. How many of those computers can you get to from the internet? Well, like four or five? You can get it to like a web server, maybe a SQL server or something, you know, not much. So clearly the Active Directory domain has a heck of a lot more computers than what the internet domain can see. All right, so on page 146, they start talking about understanding the tree. So an Active Directory domain can have multiple subdomains. So it kind of sort of looks like a tree. So here's an example. Here's a, a Ducati, or maybe that's not, well, I can't even pronounce that, um, a tree, and then they can have like a programming domain and then IT training domain underneath that. So you can have multiple subdomains, okay? Kind of sort of works. Um, so the very first one you build is the tree. That's the very first one. 
the outside triangle. And uh, so then if you wanted to add more, you could add more. Kind of makes sense? So how do you get there? Well, you promote a machine to be a domain controller, which we're going to do. Okay, so this is called a forest. This is a, a tree domain. Here's a tree domain. Here's a tree domain. And then underneath that, I mean, this together is considered the forest. I don't, you know, don't get hung up over the names. So basically a group of domains that are all under this control of the same organization is a forest. Okay. So it could be you broke this thing up because instead of having, you know, kumquat.com, you could have east.kumquat.com and west.kumquat.com. So, right. So the East Coast one could have their own domain and the West Coast could have their own domain. And then wherever the headquarters are, it doesn't matter where it is. It could be on either coast. Making sense? Okay. So a subdomain is like a child. No big deal. So again, the, the, the forests do not have to have contiguous naming. So here's the name that is contiguous. For example, this is a child domain. So this one clearly is underneath that one. But this one is not. This one is a tree domain by itself. So here's an example of one where, you know, the tree domain, a tree domain. And so here's the scenario. Let's say that you bought out a rival and you want to bring their stuff into your forest, okay? I don't want to have to rename everything. I don't want to have to rename their domain or anything like that. So your your name is Kumquat and you got the forest. And so you bought out your competitor who named Kum, whose name is Wombat. And so you just want to tuck those guys in. So clearly the name of the forest is not going to match the name of this other tree down here. Okay, just like here, the name here, ittraining.local, doesn't have any relationship whatsoever to whatever the heck that is, dot local. Okay? Okay, good. Okay, understanding master roles in page 148. So Active Directory's got tons of moving parts, lots of moving parts, and I'm not going to bore you with all of them. But uh, these, there are these roles, and they're called, uh, by the way, they have an acronym for it. Of course they do. The Flexible Single Master Operation, FSMO. And yeah, unfortunately, this is stuff that shows up on certification exams a lot for some reason. They're obsessed over this stuff. So most of the roles, you can have multiple of them. So if you had like five domain controllers, you could have that role appear in all five, which would be a good idea for redundancy. But there are a few roles that you can only have one of. Now, they don't all have to be in the same spot, but you can only have one of them. And when I explain what those roles are, it's going to make a little bit of sense. Okay. So the first one is called the Relative Identifier RID. How's that for a cool thing? And this is the thing, whenever you create a new user, it takes a domain ID and then puts this relative ID, to, bolts it on, and so I'm basically, I'm user number 1001. And so the next guy is 1002, right? How that works? Well, you can imagine how confusing it would be if it was two people giving out those numbers. That would be possibility of, oops, I added a user over here at the same time you were adding a user over here and we both ended up with the same number. Ooh, bad. So it kind of makes sense that the RID, there would only be one of Now, it doesn't matter where it is, but there can only be one of them. Another one's called the primary domain controller emulator. Back in the Windows NT days, we're talking ancient history now, you had this thing called, you know, the uh, primary domain controller. And it did lots of things to include like setting the time, things like that. Um, so <clears throat> what happens now is that it, this emulator thing still exists uh, for things like password changes. So if I change a password, I need to have that go to one machine and it replicates it. By the way, this is high speed replication. It's like, we need to get this out really or soon, quick. So when you change your password, in theory, as soon as you're done, you could go to any other machine. It'll instantly know the new password. It won't be going, oh, wait, I didn't get the news. Okay. So we need one location that's going to take those responses and send them out to the others. And same thing with account lockout. If I lock out an account, I don't want you to go, go to this other machine and say, well, I didn't see, I didn't get the notice. I'll let you in. No, you're locked out. Okay, cool. And then, ah, what the heck? We're coming up on the 15-minute mark. 